Welcome to our first video on domes, in which we're going to focus on basic definitions and behavior. A dome structure has a form that is generated by rotating a portion of a circle, ellipse, parabola, catenary, or some other curved form about a vertical axis thereby sweeping out a three-dimensional form that is high at the center and gets progressively lower until it meets the foundation around the perimeter. A dome is an example of a synclastic shape which is defined by a curved surface such that at any point on the surface, the surface curves to the same side for all directions of movement along the surface from that original point. We typically simplify this wording to a surface having double curvature to the same side. The antonym of synclastic is anticlastic, describing shapes defined by a curved surface such that at any point on the surface, the surface curves to one side for some directions of movement from the point and to the opposite side for other directions of movement from the point. We typically simplify this wording to a surface having double curvature to opposite sides. An example is a saddle surface, such as a hyperbolic paraboloid or an interior portion of a toroidal surface. The topmost point right here on the dome is called the zenith curves running from the zenith to the perimeter foundation, so a curve such as this one, is called a meridian. For a dome with a spherical shape, these curves are great circles. In other words, if I take this and I track it all the way around to the other side, that is a portion of a great circle. These curves are analogous to longitude on the Earth. Horizontal planes intersect the dome in circles that are called parallels. So here's an example. Here is another example. This, by the way, in this particular example is a great circle because this particular shape that we chose to generate is a hemisphere and the bottom circle is a great circle. Each of these circles, this one, that one, and that one, and so forth, are called small circles. And we sometimes refer to certain types of domes, network domes, as being small circle domes. The parallels are analogous to latitude on the Earth. A dome may consist of a simple thin shell, a thin shell reinforced by ribs, or an open network of struts connected together in a triangular pattern that generally assumes the domical shape. We will use the word struts often. A strut is like a column, except it's not necessarily vertical. In fact, it typically can have any orientation in space. It's very capable of resisting tension, it's very good at resisting compression, but it's usually designed to be fairly slender and structurally efficient. So it's not great as a bending member, but it can serve in that mode also. This latter type of structure is referred to as a network dome. There are various categories of network domes, such as radial domes, Lamella domes, pisector domes, and geodesic domes, all of which will be discussed later. A really crucial part of dome action is buttressing. And to understand that, we're going to start with a quick review of arches, which we talked about before in a previous video, which will illuminate many things regarding domes. So in that previous video, we talked about an arch of this general shape subjected to a uniform gravity load uh, spanning a length L. 
and you'll notice here we've shown a compression force uh, at the support point which is parallel to the direction of the arch axis the centroid or the central axis of this curved form that force that support force has to be in that direction in order for this curved element to act like a true arch if there was any component perpendicular like a force off in this direction or off in that direction then that would induce bending in this element and it would not be behaving like a true arch we can take this compressive force at the support and break it down into a horizontal component, which we call the buttressing force, and a vertical component, which we call the support force. This vertical force has to be WL over two. By the symmetry of it, this vertical force is the same on each end. They are equal to each other, so they have to be equal to, each one has to be equal to half the total gravity load on the arch, W is the gravity load as distributed in pounds per linear foot uh, or kips per linear foot, and L is the length. So W times L is the total gravity force. Half of that gravity force is WL over two. So that will be the vertical support force at the end. That force is imposed upon us by the design situation and it does not change. We as designers can change other things like the rise of the arch and that will affect the horizontal force, but we always have to find a way to support this gravity force. Now, as we've talked about in the past, we can slice this arch down the middle and take a free body. When we create this free body, of the left hand side of this arch we remove this portion from our picture and we replace it with a depiction of what it is doing to the left hand side of the arch so we still have our horizontal force here our vertical force here our distributive force there and now we have to represent what's happening at that interface right there due to the portion of the arch that we removed now by the symmetry of this structure we know that one side of this structure can't be pulling up or pulling down on the other side because that would suggest an asymmetry in the relationship between them so this force that's exerted here has to be a horizontal force can't be a vertical force we also know that because we have a vertical force here which is wl over 2 and then we have a downward force here which is also wl over 2 because we chose to slice through this free body at the center so when we take the sum of all the vertical forces we know they have to be zero this upward force and a downward force here and so there can't be a vertical force upward here or a vertical force downward. So this horizontal force has to be horizontal. And furthermore, it has to be equal and opposite to that because they're the only horizontal forces on this uh, free body. So we're going to take that picture down. So I've just repeated that picture here with our horizontal but buttressing force, our vertical support force, in this internal force H, which is now an external force on the left-hand free body. And now I'm gonna replace this distributed force, W, uh, which happens to be applied over a length L over two because I took half of the free body. So when I do that, I end up with a vertical force downward of WL over 2, which is at the center of this distributed force. And that happens to be at the center of this free body. So the length of the free body is L over 2. The center of that then is L over 4 from the end.
So if I said, well, what's the moment of these two vertical forces? It's going to be one of those forces times this lever arm, which is WL over 2 times L over 4. And when we work all those numbers out, it comes to WL squared over 8, which is a formula we've talked about many times. It's the inevitable moment which is applied because we are spanning as opposed to getting our support directly under whatever force we're dealing with. So that's a clockwise moment. It's tending to produce clockwise motion. These two horizontal forces are tending to produce counterclockwise motion. And their moment, by the way, is H times their lever arm. So we could figure out what H is by saying H times L sub H is equal to WL squared over eight. So, that explains the behavior of an arch. The question becomes then, what happens when the buttressing force is not provided? So here we have an image of an arch. You'll notice we've shown these uh, bearing, or these uh, stresses at the end of the arch as if it is properly buttressed. So all these stress vectors are parallel to the axial direction of the arch at the support point. This axial stress at the arch support accounts for both the vertical support force and the horizontal buttressing force. So if we remove the horizontal buttressing force, we could present that conceptually like this, where we're showing the same curved element again, but now at the ends, we're only showing the vertical support force and we've gotten rid of the horizontal force here. Conceptually, we could look at what's happening in the end, at the end of this curved element, and we could represent it where we've kind of carved off an, uh, a flat space on the bottom. We've introduced a roller element, which is sitting on a horizontal surface that can only produce a vertical force upward. That's how we might represent it conceptually. In reality, it probably would be more commonly like this. So we, here we have two slender support walls, which are perfectly capable of resisting vertical forces of gravity. And they have supporting, uh, resting on them, this curved element. Now, the curved element would love to have some buttressing force, but it's so powerful by the nature of its geometry that it will push these walls over as much as necessary and so the walls, because they're so slender and because they don't work well as bending elements coming up out of the earth, these walls are not capable of providing any significant buttressing force. So in a, in a sense, we would change our whole geometry of the arch where here we have the thing squared off to allow these stresses that are axial stresses to act on that squared off end of the arch in the case of this new situation, we would change this configuration so there's a flat surface, or I should say a horizontal surface, at the end of this curved element so it can rest gently and appropriately on the top of that wall, which is going to provide the support for it. So, now we can go back to our diagrams, which are a little less detailed but important, and ask ourselves, what's going on now at this point. So again, we resolve our distributed force into a vertical force, which is coming downward. It is equal in magnitude to this vertical support force. It's creating our classic applied moment of WL squared over eight. And now the only place we can get some moment is on the end, this slice point. Um, which has to do with what the portion of the right-hand part of the curved member is doing to the left-hand part of the curved member. And initially, we just diagram this with a curved arrow and a capital M, meaning we know there's got to be some kind of moment there, but we're not describing it in any detail. But this is what it would look like. Um, just like any beam spanning a length L under a uniform load W, we're going to have an applied moment of WL squared over 8, 
we have to have an internal resisting moment, which in this case is going to come in the form of a bending stress with maximum compression on the top, maximum tension on the bottom. So this curved element, which for all the world looks like an arch because it has the shape that we expect an arch to have, is not acting at all like an arch. It is acting like a beam. And the only difference is it's a beam with some curvature. So it has a rise to it, but that rise has no, no structural benefit or structural significance. So all the lever arm for this beam is within the vertical dimension of the beam. And in fact, the lever arm for these two net forces is actually two thirds of the depth of whatever this cross section is. It's not a very good lever arm. And as a consequence, these stresses will be very, these forces, C and T, will be very high. But then when you account for the triangulated nature of the bending stress, you have this stress exaggeration at the very top and bottom. So from a stress point of view, this is a very unfortunate way to use this curvilinear membrane. So up here we show the axial stresses. Down here we show the bearing stresses when this thing is just um, supported on flimsy walls that can move outward or inward as they need to. Um, these stresses are slightly different than those. What's really horrific, though, are the stresses that are going to occur at the center now. So here we show some stresses at the base of the arch, which is where the stresses are worst in the arch. And we're, here we're showing the bending stresses at the center after we remove the buttressing forces so it's no longer acting like a true arch in, in axial compression. It's acting like a bend, bending member because there's no buttressing action to allow it to act as an arch. Um, in order to be able to keep these bending stresses within the frame of our image, we've had to draw these axial stresses this short. These bending stresses at the extreme point are 35 times those for this particular configuration which I'll go back and tell you again. It has a cross section of glue lamb, which is one foot wide by three feet deep. It has a rise of 25 feet. It's spanning 100 feet. It has a load of 9,000 pounds per foot. So if we had a time member across here, which was helping us develop this buttressing force, and we go and cut that time member, then suddenly the lever arm is not the rise of the arch, which has a horizontal force here and a horizontal force up there. The lever arm is contained within the depth of this beam cross section. It's a huge change. When we cut that tie, the stress level goes from a certain axial level to a bending stress that's 35 times as high. So let's talk about proper dome action, which requires a buttressing force. Just as in the case of an arch, the dome in its most efficient and ideal form carries the loads by acting in compression without any bending stresses. In order to avoid bending stresses in the dome shell and to assure that all the force is transferred in the form of pure compression, down the meridians, the dome must be buttressed by the earth or held together with a tie member at the base. This tie member is usually in the form of a tension ring around the base of the dome, but it could be a series of tension members running di diametrically across the base of the dome. So here's a dome that's beginning to split at the base because there is no tension ring about the base. Um, the structural action of this has been dramatically diminished by the lack of a tension member. So here we have a dome. You'll notice this dome comes down and then it breaks up because people need to be able to walk through it. So the dome comes in complete form to this edge. 
these compression members that are buttressing the dome have been made wide at the top so they engage as much of the dome as possible. And then they've been made as narrow as possible at the base in order to allow as much human traffic into the building as possible. It's an incredibly beautiful structure in Norfolk, Virginia. It was designed by Pierre Luigi Nervi. Now, there can be a tension ring up here, and there probably is, and it is probably taking some of the outward force, the outward thrust of the dome at that point. But there can also be uh, either buttressing or a tension ring at the base. The means of lateral stabilization of the structure is through these sloped elements, so there's at least some buttressing at the base of these elements. So down below, there is almost certainly uh, some kind of big footing and another big footing back there. And there can be a tension member running from this point to that point and then to the point of the base of the next support point. And you'll notice those things don't all line up, which is good because we end up with a cusp in the tension member that allows it to act properly. Here's a dome where there are no buttressing elements, clearly. Uh, this portion right here can't possibly take the outward thrust of this dome, so this dome has to have a tension ring around the base of the dome. This is the Louisiana Superdome or the Mercedes-Benz Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, um, we talked about the importance of leverage for structural action in arches and the notion of the importance of the proportions of the rise to span. So we're gonna go back to arches again, just briefly to illustrate a point. If we have a very shallow arch, the lever arm for the horizontal forces is very low. So the horizontal forces have to be very large in order to provide the internal resisting moment. When we double the rise of the arch, we double the lever arm for the horizontal forces and the horizontal forces are then cut in half. If we double it again, the horizontal forces are cut in half again. So what this says is we would really like to have a, a nice deep arch or a nice deep dome in order to reduce that horizontal force. However, you'll notice there's sort of diminishing returns because what we're really concerned about is the magnitude of this axial compression force uh, that is parallel to the direction of the arch where the support is occurring. This C force is much larger than that one, which is larger than that one, but now suddenly the horizontal forces are becoming much less significant and the support forces are becoming greater. So there becomes a point where it's just not worth making the dome taller as a way of trying to diminish the horizontal force because we reach the point of diminishing returns. The other issue is we don't want a dome with a huge amount of surface area that we have to pay for. And furthermore, the taller the dome gets, the more likely it is to take wind load. And uh, so suddenly the horizontal forces begin to be more significant. So generally speaking, we're going to want a dome some with proportions somewhere in this zone. Maybe a little higher than that, maybe not so high compared to that. So again, we have the Louisiana Superdome, and you'll notice its proportions are about in the zone of what I mentioned. Likewise, the proportions of this dome are very similar to this. Now, sometimes we want a dome that's taller. Here we're showing a full hemispherical dome. Um, if there's some volumetric purpose to doing that, um, you can certainly do that. You can even do something like this where you're taking more than the hemisphere. So here's a hemisphere from there up, but we're beginning to curve back under. Now, when we do that, as this gets taller, we get more and more wind load on it, and the base starts to get narrower. So from a point of view of resisting overturning moments, that is definitely not the way to go. On the other hand, if you have some architectural purpose uh, or you just want to express a sense of excitement, you can do that. So this is the Expo 67 Dome, which was designed by Buckminster Fuller and Shoji Shadow, who, who did a lot of the technical work for Buckminster Fuller, and it was a great designer in his own right. 
they did this for Expo 67, and because of the nature of what they were putting inside, they decided to make it more than a hemisphere. Uh, it's not necessarily structurally that logical, but uh, it made sense in terms of the particular design project they were working on. Now, in spite of the fact that this is beginning to have some problems with catching too much wind load and narrowing the base, it's still an amazingly efficient, lightweight, delicate structure. Very beautiful and very impressive. This, by the way, is the um, Disney Dome at Disney World at the Epcot Center. It's not really a dome in the normal sense in that it does not come down and engage the ground. And you have to be very careful in interpreting this because a thin shell dome, the last thing you want to do is go create huge localized forces right here. It's kind of like a, an eggshell. Uh, an eggshell can be pretty strong, but then if you take a pin and stick it into the side of the eggshell, it'll tend to punch through fairly easily. So the last thing we want to do is have a thin-shelled sphere like this with support points like that. So somewhere within this, probably in this entire zone down here, there's a huge amount of truss work which is supporting this whole portion of the dome and gathering those forces and delivering them to these huge pylons. So those pylons are poking into a dense network of structure which is rerouting the normal forces to get those forces into the pylons. But this is an example of a really extraordinarily beautiful and complete geodesic dome. And that ends our first video on domes focusing on basic definitions and behavior.